Welcome to today's webinar, the third in our series with Sustainable Minds and Avitru, bringing you transparency as the new green in product selection specification. We're really excited today to welcome all of you uh, into this third webinar that we're doing together and especially welcoming our special guest, Liz Sophia. Liz, take it away. Thanks, Terry, and, and thank you all for joining us today. As you might know, this webinar is part of an ongoing series. Last month, we introduced the trend report, and today we have the opportunity to actually take a deep dive and talk in more detail about PCRs and EPDs, so product category rules and environmental product declarations. And, and Terry is going to walk you through a lot of the detail with regard to the trend report, our methodology, the results, and also address the state of product transparency. We'll go through environmental reporting, the trends and totals, and also some detail behind the scenes in the Sustainable Minds Transparency Catalog. And then we'll talk through product group benchmarking. And for those of you who don't know Terry, we are uh, um, we have been in a partnership for quite a while now, and, and Terry is the founder and CEO CEO of Sustainable Minds and has been for the last 11 years. And, and Terry's very humble, but Terry has uh, won some awards for innovation. She's been recognized by Gartner and nominated as a World Economic Technology Partner. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be sharing the, the next hour with Terry and learn from her because she really is a thought leader in the area of sustainability and, and a true friend to the AECO community. With regard to the webinar today, we will address questions if you put them in the panel. Uh, we do have about 50 minutes of content and we'll save some time at the end to address anything that uh, is not covered early on. And if we don't get to your questions during this session, we will follow up with you in the next couple of days. So I gave you the background on Terry. Uh, I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Avitru. Avitru, you might have known us formerly as Arcom. We went through an extensive rebrand and reimagination of how we view the industry back in November. And so we have, if you haven't taken a look at our website or checked out any of our social properties, I encourage you to do so. We are a strategic partner of the American Institute of Architects and the exclusive developer of Master Spec. We have over 70, uh, 60 employees, uh, focused uh, architects, engineers. We have offices in Portland, Maine, Salt Lake City, Atlanta, Georgia, Alexandria, Virginia. And we are the most widely used guide specification system in the United States. So uh, with about 80% of the ENR top 100 using master spec. And our commitment, our vision really is to construct a world where better building leads to better lives. So the partnership with the Sustainable Minds team is certainly very important to us. And I hope that you enjoy the content today. Thank you, Liz. We're pretty pleased to be here with you to be able to bring product transparency further into the mainstream through the reach that the Vitru and the AIA have. So to add on to who is Avitru, who is Sustainable Minds, uh, we're a software company, just, just like Avitru is, except our focus has always been to uh, build software tools for product manufacturers and now uh, for uh, AECs to be able to access product transparency information in the cloud to be able to get real, real work done. Now, we are a mission-based company, which means that our mission is to operationalize environmental performance into mainstream product development, manufacturing to drive innovation, revenue, and growth. It means that everything we build and everything we do is in service to achieving that mission to ultimately create real change uh, in the world. And you're going to see how that uh, plays out in the story that uh, we'll continue to tell you today. At Sustainable Minds, we have deep expertise in product transparency, life cycle assessment, expertise, material ingredient disclosure, expertise. We are an ISO 14025 program operator, and we're going to get into a little bit of a deep dive on that, which was the content of, of uh, today's topic. And 
what we bring to all of that is also deep expertise in design, in customer experience, information design, and design of cloud software to be able to make really complex ideas clear and easy and accessible. And you're going to see that play out as well. I am the founder of Sustainable Minds, and uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. My first company was an internet strategy and product development firm, so I've been doing this a long time. Um, our very first product, though, that we brought to market back in 2009 uh, was an easy-to-use lifecycle assessment tool that would allow product development teams to evaluate product concepts in early-stage design and be able to make informed trade-off decisions about any of the inputs across the life cycle to ultimately design greener products from the start. And so when you put this whole story together of this virtuous cycle of designing and marketing of manufacturing and uh, ultimately specifying uh, your demand for manufacturers to actually make higher performing, i.e. greener and healthier products is what's going to drive that continuous improvement of products actually being higher performing. So we're going to dive into that and you know, together with Avitru and why we're really both sides couldn't be more thrilled to be doing this together, uh, is we know that you know the last mile from getting a manufacturer to making a better product and getting you, the uh, building professional, to find, select, and specify that product is actually making sure that it gets into the spec and it can't be switched out for something else. So. Together, we're going to be working on making product master spec more robust for manufacturers to be able to get language into their product master specs specific to their transparency disclosures. We're going to help you learn more about those manufacturers and their products so that you can make better informed selection specification decisions. And, you know, bottom line, make it easy to find those manufacturers and their products with transparency information, whether it's at that manufacturer's website, in the catalog, and sometime soon this year uh, through master spec. And through it all, we're going to be delivering continuing education both to the manufacturing community as well as to you, the AEC community, on what is product transparency, what does it mean, how does it get used, and how can it be used to actually you know, drive this continuous improvement loop. So as a result, uh, Sustainable Minds does a lot of work and spends a lot of time uh, doing strategy work. And, you know, what drives strategy? Well, research. And so we've really been uh, doing R&D since 2012, since product transparency became a thing, because we'd already been working on helping manufacturers design greener products. And so now we saw the opportunity to help them market these greener products, particularly into the building construction industry. So at the end of 2017, and this is the story that I'm going to tell you now, you know, we saw a five-year period from introduction of product transparency as a concept to product transparency becoming pretty well established, you know, in the hearts and minds of uh, people in the building industry who are of the mind of building uh, greener buildings. And so this trend report uh, is the summary of that story and uh, all the data to support it. So uh, we're going to revisit the overview, which we had delivered in last month's report. And then we're going to do a deep dive into the first part, which is the environmental reporting and in a subsequent webinar, we'll then do a deep dive on the other piece, the material ingredient reporting. So we're not going to get into that topic today. So like any technical document, uh, the trend report starts out with the definitions and methodology section and then presents the results right up front. So people who like to read executive summaries only need to read those two pages and you're good and you can go. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, 
So starting out with definitions and methodology, um, this is actually how we collect the data for the transparency catalog. It's, it was this R&D process uh, that has allowed us to build the catalog and continually, continually update it with new manufacturers and new, uh, new products and, and new uh, types of reports. So the intent of the catalog is to acknowledge and reward all the manufacturers who are investing in product transparency, whether they're doing a little bit or a lot. And investing in product transparency specifically means that they are conducting one or both types of technical studies, and they are disclosing the results. The kind of technical study we're going to look at today is the study that evaluates the environmental performance of a product across its life cycle, the technical standard that's used for this study uh, is ISO 14025, environmental labels and declarations. And in that standard, 14025, contains two types of rules. One is the rules for how a program operator, so that's an entity who decides they're going to be in the business of creating PCRs and EPDs, so Sustainable Minds is a program operator. So it lays out the rules for how product category rules need to be created and what goes into them. What are the rules? So in a PCR, there's two types of rules. The rules for how LCA is going to get done for a particular type of product category. And then the other set of rules is the rules for the content that's going to get included in the report. And the report coming out of an ISO 14025 uh, technical standard process is called a Type 3 Environmental Declaration. The term EPD is a colloquialism. The actual technical term is Type 3 Environmental Declaration. And what is required in an EPD is some of the LCA results, the life cycle assessment results, plus other info as described in categories that they're that they've called out but it's entirely up to the program operator and the participants in the PCR process what LCA content goes in to the type 3 environmental declaration and what other info goes into the type 3 environmental declaration and that's really important to kind of stash away for later when we start talking about how not all PCRs are alike. In fact, the problem that has persisted in the first part of this five-year cycle is that most PCRs are really unalike, uh, which has created uh, a lot of difficulties and certainly has undermined you know, any, any attempts at, at comparability uh, until recently. So know that all of the products listed in the transparency catalog meet the eligibility requirements for both types of product transparency credits in one or more of the green building rating systems. And again, the purpose for that is to be able to reward building professionals for specifying their products to earn those credits and criteria in those green building rating systems. So every month, uh, the Sustainable Minds team goes to all of the uh, websites of all of the North American program operators uh, to look for new manufacturers and, and new EPDs and new PCRs. Uh, these are the three green building rating systems that reward environmental performance reporting. And again, on the materials side, there's a lot more programs uh, green building rating systems that reward material ingredient reporting. And there are a number of different material ingredient disclosure programs that have been identified as acceptable. And in contrast to environmental reporting, which uses only one technical standard, ISO 14025, on the material ingredient side, each one of these programs uses their own technical standard. They're similar, but they're different. 
And again, we'll get into that in a whole other webinar. So here's the results. Here's the, here's the punchline. What we found over five years, and again, the data reporting period is what data was valid from January 1st to December 31st of 2017. So of 35 active CSI master format divisions, manufacturers in 24 of those divisions have created one or both types of disclosures. So 1,225 EPDs in 19 of those divisions and 8,404 material ingredient disclosures in 24 divisions. And what that looks like is this. Uh, you can do a quick scan. You can see the number of EPDs and the number of material ingredient disclosures. And you can see that the top uh, most, most popular master format divisions that have the most product uh, transparency disclosures are finishes and furnishings. And a big part of why furnishings, for example, has such a big number of material ingredient disclosures has to do with BIFMA uh, having given out 3,900 BIFMA level certificates. So kudos to BIFMA for doing such a great job of getting their members' products certified uh, to a disclosure uh, accepted by all of the uh, green building rating systems. So let's unbundle what that total means. There's a whole bunch of stuff pack, packed up in that. So we're going to talk about the state of product transparency. And this is actually from the table of contents of of the transparency report that will be available online next week. Anybody can download it, it's free uh, in the spirit of transparency. Um, so I'm just gonna proceed with, with the story. And here's the frame that we've put this story into, which is that uh, product transparency in the building products industry is in fact a new technology. The science and methods behind the measuring, evaluating, and reporting themselves are well established. They're not new. But using product transparency in product selection and product marketing is an innovation. So when we go back and look at in 2012, when USGBC announced lead version four, and that product transparency was one of the cornerstone concepts. Uh, they effectively were saying that, look, single attribute ratings and certifications that were awarded in lead version three are, are still important, and they tell an important slice of a story in a given product category. But the problem was that uh, not all product categories had certifications or ratings specific to them. Uh, they were all different. Only a handful, like recycled content, could apply to more. And they only tell a slice of a story. And so, you know, clearly there was a need for a more scientific, a more technical, and a more broad based set of methods that could be used across all product categories in the same way to comprehensively look at the life cycle impacts and the potential hazards and risks presented by the materials. In, in every product category. So that's not to discount the single attribute certifications. It's simply to say there's a new way of measuring performance, and that's by using one or both of these types of technical uh, evaluation methods. And so there is a really great uh, theory called the diffusion of innovations that helps us understand what what's happened so far and how it's happened and, and will really make people feel confident that um, there is no turning back. Uh, product transparency has already been successful in uh, motivating manufacturers to make actually higher performing products. So this diffusion of innovation theory says that uh, any technology, uh, for it to become popularized requires four main elements uh, for that to happen. Uh, the innovation itself, the communication channels, 
some period of time and a social system. Um, and many of you, probably every single one of you on the call, have heard the term the tipping point. And so, uh, you know, we're kind of looking at when is the tipping point kind of happening uh, in product transparency. And we believe very clearly, and the data shows, we are arriving at that tipping point. We clearly have in this product transparency story, the social system of you folks on this call, the AEC community and the manufacturers making their products, the innovation of doing uh, product transparency uh, analysis and reporting over time. And every single participant in this space, program operators like Sustainable Minds and NSF and UL and SGS, all the NGOs and nonprofits, USGBC, BIFMA, all of the other uh, uh, nonprofit organizations and industry groups, all of the media and solution providers, Building Green, uh, Mindful Materials, Ecomedes, everybody who has come into this space has been a proponent to raise awareness and really, really float all boats. And if we're all doing this for the right reasons, which is ultimately to reduce the impact of the built environment on the natural environment and human health, then everybody's participation in the way that they are participating has a positive contribution. So I'm going to tell you about Sustainable Minds contribution, and I'm going to show you what, what it looks like too, because showing is easier to, to comprehend than just a word. So uh, back in uh, October of, of 2016 and in the months leading up to it, uh, we ultimately recognized that there was enough activity that had already happened in the product transparency space to start to scrape together uh, a place where uh, AECs could be able to find those manufacturers who were investing in, in product transparency. And when we went live uh, at Greenbuild in 2016, there were 350 brands from all of the places where we look, all the program operators and all the material ingredient disclosure programs, 350 brands who had done something, either a lot or a little, but they had done something. So you can see we launched with 350 brands. Uh, a short 14 months later, we had accumulated 961 brands and industry organizations uh, in the catalog with a breakdown of 516 had done environmental performance reporting only, 405 had done material ingredient reporting only, and 93 had done both. Now, the way that we got to 961 was during 2017, we then started looking hard at the industry-wide EPDs. And the participants in those industry-wide EPDs and the industry organizations who organized and sponsored those industry-wide EPDs. So we added all of those industry groups and the participants in the industry-wide EPDs to the catalog. So that's 313 new folks, new, new groups added, plus 298 new manufacturers with product-specific EPDs and or material disclosures which this number, just this number, represented an 85% increase in the number of brands investing in product transparency in just in 14 months, which I think is a pretty significant uptick. Uh, and so the point to all this is that, you know, what, what got all this started was you know, the USGBC and LEED saying, you know, product transparency, this thing as we define it, uh, it, is going to be important and we're going to motivate building professionals to specify those products. And that's why we've created these new credits, uh, the material and resource credits. Um, so you can, you know, specify products with 
EPDs or industry-wide EPDs and then the different material disclosures and, uh, and you're going to earn those credits. But what product transparency is really about is it's about performance. And if you look at all of the previous and current other criteria and credits in the green building rating systems, they're all about measuring performance. So high performance is now how the industry refers to successful buildings and environmental performance and material ingredients is now just part of that high performance uh, overview. And what they really are, are performance criteria, environmental performance and material health are performance criteria. What we're going to see happening now moving forward and what the industry really needs and wants is the ability to be able to use these technical disclosures to understand the relative performance criteria of each of these products and be able to make those decisions uh, based on truly understanding this information as performance criteria. Uh, criterion. And you know, what we tell manufacturers who still maybe have in the back of their mind that making greener and healthier products might be more expensive. The fact is that where there are impacts in the life cycle of a product, there are costs. Where you can reduce impacts, there are always cost reductions. And that's part of the, the strategy and the design process. And that's why you have to know what's causing those impacts in which life cycle stage so that strategies can be applied to those decisions to make, uh, make improvements and ultimately have a real story to tell, that manufacturer have a real story to tell about what they're doing to improve the performance of their products and then be able to present that information to you and correlate the technical data with the actions to be able to say, look, we're doing this and here's the result. We've installed uh, you know, these filters on our, on our uh, smokestacks and our factory. It's reducing particulates by X amount and therefore it's improving the environmental performance in three environmental impact categories. Uh, and now that's a story that people can start to kind of wrap their brains around and, and actually learn, you know, what is an impact category? What, what's impacting it? What, you know, why should I care about which ones get reported? Because in, in the technical standards, this is all called out, which impact categories should be getting reported. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think everybody's going to want to know why, why those five or six and what is the manufacturer actually doing and how much has it changed? So, you know, we, when we talk to manufacturers, we, we also point out that getting on board with product transparency now, because now it's not uh, early adoption, we're getting into early mainstream, uh, it, it's all about future proofing because those manufacturers who hung back uh, hung back because they didn't really know how things were going to play out. Uh, but now, as you've seen, there's enough manufacturers across most of the active CSI master format divisions who have gotten involved in product transparency that really, uh, in the next year or two, any manufacturer who really is going to stay top of mind in this space has got to be uh, producing uh, transparency information. And, you know, you, the AEC community, were great at kickstarting uh, the awareness and the demand through the letter writing campaign that happened in, in 2013 uh, and all the other constituents in this social system and the communication channels have, have driven that forward. But one thing that's pretty interesting, and we've got some good data in the trend report about this, uh, is that uh, there's never going to be a reversal in demand for this information uh, because of the millennial generation. Uh, They're increasingly taking over a significant share of the workforce. And this is the generation that was uh, really born with devices 
uh, relying on devices for data, making comparisons, uh, comparative decisions, pretty much for anything that gets done. Uh, it's not going to be an option for manufacturers to not produce this information and ultimately make it understandable and usable to support uh, comparative decision making. So here's what's pretty interesting, uh, and I'm sure a bunch of you on this call, because when you registered, we asked, are you involved in uh, specifying products with transparency information? And most, most people answered yes, or at least selecting. Um, what the data cannot tell us, like we know how many manufacturers, we know how many EPDs, we know how many material ingredient disclosures. What we don't know is the number of products that those total number of disclosures represent. It's not countable because that information is not contained in the disclosures. So if we were to do a kind of back of envelope calculation and say, look, we at least know that there's you know, a little over 9,000 total disclosures, the 8,000 8, something material ingredient ones, the 1,200 EPDs, so there's 9,000 something, if at a minimum, each of those represents one product, which we know is not actually true, uh, Sustainable Vines even supported one manufacturer creating HPDs that covered over 1,200 products in each HPD. So one could uh, imagine a one-to-one -one correlation, 10-to-one, uh, 100 to one even thousands to one. It's somewhere in that range. And so using that uh, extrapolation, uh, we know that there are at least 9,629 products with transparency information, or there could be almost a million already today in the market. And we did a little bit of comparison uh, looking at the sweets catalog, how many manufacturers were in sweets and how many products. Uh, we actually know that from roughly the same number of manufacturers, there are at least the same number of products with transparency information. And of course it maps the same, uh, the top division is, is finishes. So the transparency catalog was designed with this insight from day one, uh, because you know what we say is that, you know, Building professionals aren't looking for disclosures. You're looking for products with disclosures. So the Sustainable Minds Transparency Catalog is the only solution, uh, provides the only solution to this particular uh, conundrum. This is an example of what uh, a manufacturer's uh, listing page looks like in the catalog, and we're going to do a little bit of a, a tour uh, in, in just a minute or two. Um, but what you can see is that this page is organized by CSI Master Format Division. So you can see here a partial view of the Owens Corning listing. So all of their products are organized by CSI Master Division and section using the uh, terminology, the Master Format terminology. And then we append the manufacturer's brand name, product group name, family name, uh, so that it's identifiable as their products. And then within each section, um, you can see the product that they have and which types of disclosures they have for those products. And when I click this link, for example, this product link, it takes me to the product information on the manufacturer's website. This one takes me to the EPD. And these take me directly to the declare label, the cradle to cradle material health certificate. And in a glance, Anyone can see uh, that these disclosures are valid uh, and Owens Corning is in the process of updating their listing um, to keep their disclosures valid. And you'll always be able to see that uh, and you'll be able to see what they have for every single product all, all in one place. So the Transparency Catalog is an educational marketing and customer service platform. And we know that uh, you and manufacturers 
have a whole bunch of choices now about where to go look for brands and their products. And all of them have something really useful to offer. You know, at the end of the day, we'd like to make the analogy that uh, it's like the travel industry where if you're going to go uh, on a trip, you have your choice of going to any one of the branded product providers. So I can go to Delta or JetBlue or United. That's a branded product provider and buy my uh, airline ticket directly from them. I can go to Hilton or any of the other Hil uh, hotel chains and buy my uh, room reservations directly from them. Or I can go to any one of the probably 20 at least travel aggregators, you know, the Orbitz, Travelocity, Priceline, Cheap Tickets, and, and buy those very same things probably for even the same price. Um, so how, how do you choose? How, how do you choose which online tools you're going to use to help you get a particular task or set of tax, tasks done? And what it ultimately comes down to is what do you believe about the brand and what's the functionality in that particular website or tool? Like, is it easy to use? Is it understandable? Does it give you certain functionality that you really like and you want to go back for? So those two things combined uh, really kind of make up the considerations for how a manufacturer chooses where they're going to put their products to be found uh, and why and by whom. Uh, not just uh, the AEC community, because remember, Sustainable Mind's mission is to help manufacturers operationalize environmental performance. So they may be okay at making disclosures. They're not great yet at figuring out how to sell those products with disclosures, how to train their sales force, how to get this information to the hands of their distributors and partners, how to really get those architectural design reps who go out and do those lunch and learns for you to be able to you know, quickly point you to products that they have, which disclosures, what are they doing? How do you map those disclosures to, to those rating systems? So what you're going to find in the catalog today is every manufacturer who's invested in product transparency in the North American market, right? You're going to see their products and their corollary environmental and material ingredient disclosures and all the products in the catalog meet one or more of the product transparency uh, eligibility requirements uh, for the range of green building rating systems. So our focus today is on the brands. Remember, we're trying to reward those brands and get those brand names to be top of mind and build that credibility uh, so that their brand is creating preference to you uh, and make making it easier to find find their products. Now, uh, in a few months, we will be adding what you would expect to a website like this, uh, a filtering set of tools to be able to find products by CSI master format. They're already organized that way. But the reason that we've not implemented that functionality yet is because the transparency catalog is not a product database. Now, technically, yes, it has a product database behind it, but we really push back on being referred to as a product database. We're an educational marketing and customer service platform that ultimately is designed for manufacturers to save time uh, in marketing sales, support and training their organizations, saving time and money, improving their effectiveness, letting them actually have a measurable ROI on, on their investments, and at the same time, uh, helping AECs find all the brands and their products in one place, understand what they're doing to improve, share feedback with them, and be able to reward, reward those manufacturers by ultimately selecting and, and specifying uh, their products. And if we can do this collectively, everybody all together, this is how we're all going to create that change in the market that we're working to create, which is to create higher performing, less impactful buildings. 
I'm going to just um, go through some of the challenges uh, that are persistent in the marketplace and were articulated um, at Greenbuild in 2017 at a meeting that the AIA put together of uh, manufacturers, uh, AECs, and some of the solution providers. And coming out of that was this top list of challenges still facing uh, product transparency's evolution. And so uh, these were the top four things, the need for education across the industry, the standardization of technical guidelines, the results in delivery, the ease of finding products with credible transparency information, and the ability for manufacturers to demonstrate an ROI. You know, I was um, not surprised that these came up as the issues, but pretty happy to be able to talk about how uh, we we are already uh, addressing those top four things and, and will continue uh, to do so. So, you know, everybody needs more education. That's what the catalog is. That's what this partnership and these webinars are for. As a program operator, we've been working for four years to work on the standardization of technical guidelines, the results in delivery, the catalog is designed to make it easy to find those brands and their products and for manufacturers to be able to get that, that ROI. So the deep dive on the environmental reporting portion, we're going to take a look at that standardization of uh, standards and technical documents as one of the biggest uh, barriers to uh, environmental transparency reporting uh, being easier to do, uh, less uh, cost intensive as, as it is today, and ultimately more understandable by people who need to consume that information. So a uh, quick view of some tools, uh, Sustainable Minds put together uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, the very first place anywhere that actually catalogs all of the PCRs that have been created by any program operator in, in North America and organized it by CSI master format uh, so that now there really is one place for people to go. It's always kept up to date to find all of the PCRs. You can link right to it. You can see the, uh, the uh, expiration dates, how current they are. Um, and so uh, in, in the trend report, uh, we're reporting that in at the end of 2017, uh, there were this many PCRs in each master format division, which were used to create that number of EPDs by that number of manufacturers. And so this is combined both product specific and industry wide. Remember, 68 PCRs for at least 19 of 35 master format divisions. So that's not uh, a ton yet. Um, and one of the challenges is that most PCRs to date do not include master format designations. And the reason they don't is because most PCRs, and especially the earlier ones, because they're so costly and difficult to do, cover more than one master format division, if you can believe that. And so what Sustainable Lines does every time uh, we identify a, a new PCR is we extrapolate uh, the most prominent CSI master format division number and then assign, assign it to that, uh, to that number. And that's how we uh, did our count. So uh, in 2017, 17 of those 68 expired, and six more are going to expire in, in 2018. And you know, each one of these PCRs represents a significant amount of work and time and money uh, to come together to create those rules that I told you about earlier. There are a lot of manufacturers who uh, have created uh, EPDs. That doesn't mean they were all involved in creating the PCRs, and that's a problem too that people who ultimately have to use these rules maybe weren't at the table when they were get 
getting created. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we've talked about the number of, of uh, EPDs in total. Um, so, you know, the industry-wide EPDs rep representing a small, small number of, of the total. Um, but many, many manufacturers have been involved in creating these industry-wide EPDs. But what the industry groups and many of those manufacturers are saying now is that, you know, they're not really sure that it was worth it because, you know, initially, uh, LEED, for example, valued an industry-wide EPD as only half a product, valued a product-specific EPD uh, as, a, as a full product. And that makes sense because, you know, the manufacturer is doing more work, they're being more transparent, they're spending more time and money. But uh, many of those manufacturers who were involved in the industry-wide EPDs are small manufacturers who never could have the money and time and wherewithal to ever do their own product-specific EPDs. And so in a way, they're actually being kind of punished uh, for not being uh, of the of the stature to be able to do product specific EPDs. So, you know, quick, tiny little news flash. Um, yesterday, the USGBC announced LEED version 4.1 uh, with the new uh, O&M credits. And one of those credits uh, is for purchasing products with transparency disclosures, uh, which is cool because it gives now another another credit that can be earned uh, to reward manufacturers and, and yourselves for specifying higher performing products. But the interesting thing is that they are valuing industry-wide EPDs as a full product credit equivalent to a, a product specific EPD. And I, I was really happy to see that. Now, Sustainable Minds became a program operator several years ago, again, to really address this standardization of uh, the technical rules to make it more streamlined, more understandable, more manufacturers can participate, quicker to do, uh, and ultimately producing better uh, results for people to be able to make decisions. Um, super quickly, uh, here's the overview. It's a two-part PCR program, so all the rules for how LCA gets done is in the Part A. Uh, remember I mentioned that the PCR also includes the requirements for what content goes into the Type 3 environmental declaration. So this is our appendix to Part A that describes the content requirements for what goes into uh, a Type 3 environmental declaration. We call ours a transparency report. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute, but it's a Type 3 environmental declaration. It's just our kind. Um, so very specific requirements for what goes in. And we really uh, are very, very critical in our assessment of what life cycle assessment information from the LCA, also known as the background report, is going to go into that type three environmental declaration. Uh, and our, our criteria is only information that's going to explain the environmental impacts and how the manufacturer is making the product better. All that other stuff uh, doesn't belong uh, in a type three environmental declaration, at least not one that's going to be used by people like you to be able to make comparative decisions. This is what a transparency report looks like. It's three pages. It's in the cloud. Everything somebody would need to know to make uh, an informed decision is all on page one. The LCA results, their interpretation, what the manufacturer is doing is all on page two. And page three is optional where the manufacturer can talk about every everything they're doing in each life cycle stage, contributing to uh, the results shown here on, on page two. So part B, it's a two-part PCR program, is created at what we call the product group level. And we define product groups as products that deliver the same functional performance and therefore would uh, be considered for the same specification. So we've gotten rid of the possibility of making a product category rule that has way too many product groups under that same umbrella, meaning 
too many CSI master format divisions. Um, and so the reason that it's really important to do PCRs at the product group level is ultimately you can't compare results of an LCA and an EPD if it's not done at the product group level. So our Part B creation form, is it's a form. So again, everything is standardized. This takes a matter of months for an industry group and some manufacturers to, to get through and ultimately approved. And so what we introduced last year was a new uh, guidance document to be able to create the rules for how an industry-wide EPD should be done so that it can serve as a product group benchmark to which product-specific EPDs can be compared. And so this guidance um, is pretty uh, comprehensive because it describes the entire process from how the manufacturer group forms, how the industry organization might, might pull that group together, all the data requirements, tool requirements, threshold settings, but even more importantly, how that information is going to get used in a customer-facing uh, document and ultimately for the purpose of you being able to make comparative decisions and earn the optimization credits in lead, for example, that as of today are still not yet earnable because there is no process for creating uh, product group or product category benchmarks. So uh, we'll be updating the PCR catalog so that uh, PCRs with benchmarking addendum will be identified over time. And uh, the, the piece that's really important for you guys to see um, is the report, again, the customer facing piece, where the manufacturer explains how is their product doing relative to this product group benchmark. So we designed what that would look like. So our transparency report, again, page two, has all the LCA results uh, and the interpretation to explain what it means. So in a comparative <coughs> transparency report, <coughs> excuse me, the requirements now would be not only to have tabular and statistical data, but to have interpretation. What is the manufacturer actually doing? And then be able to show the variance between the improvement or the lack of improvement in each impact category that's called for uh, to be reported. And then to be able to explain uh, how those higher performing impact categories, uh, how that higher performance was achieved, but also to talk about the lower performing categories. Uh, what isn't getting done there or what is not possible to be done there for a certain period of time. And part of the benchmarking guidance is for the industry group to set long-term improvement goals so that there's a point on the horizon for the industry to be moving towards to get the performance to be in line with those longer term goals, 2030, 2050, uh, and for manufacturers to have a better understanding of what they need to be doing to, to get there. So I'm going to pause and uh, take some questions. Uh, you know, I think I've said this all along. What does success look like? Success looks like building higher performing buildings that really do have less impact on the, built, on the natural environment and human health. And when this happens, everybody benefits. Ultimately, our ask to you, AEC community, is for manufacturers to add their products to the transparency catalog and to participate in creating PCRs or addendum to PCRs using this benchmarking guidance to then create industry-wide EPDs. So Liz, how are we doing on the questions front? 
So we've got a couple of questions, uh, Terry. One is asking for a deeper dive about the rewards, specifically what are the rewards given to building professionals for specifying healthy green products? Um, we talked about the different programs, LEAD, WELL, LBC, but if a designer or builder isn't going for the green building credits, then how can we incentivize them to specify the healthy green products? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, really, it becomes uh, there's several avenues in. Uh, if you are the designer or the architect and you're not able to influence to the degree you would like, as to what gets into the spec, uh, then you're at the point in the process where there's still education for you to do to the specifier and to the owner and the contractor about why building a higher performing building uh, and why environmental performance and material ingredients are performance criteria. They're, you know, don't they want to build a higher performing building? When you look at the cost to build, the cost to operate, the cost for occupancy, there's a whole range of uh, really Im important educational concepts to uh, convey. And that's something that we're going to be working on in, in terms of uh, curriculum, talking points, uh, webinars to really, um, you know, help you uh, make that case. And Terry, I think we have time for one more. I think uh, I can take this one. It says, what incentive do manufacturers have to develop their specs in master spec format? Many manufacturers have their own proprietary spec in their literature or websites, but are not compatible with the master spec formatting. So uh, we can definitely follow up with you after this, but you know, a product master spec can drop right into an architect or engineer's project manual, and it can match the formatting, the language, and voice with no additional work on the part of the architect or engineer writing the spec. It also describes the manufacturer's products at whatever level of detail that the manufacturer desires. So with that, Terry, I think we're at the top of the hour. And again, if there are additional questions, please reach out and we will be happy to follow up with you. The slides will be available after this and um, we hope you enjoyed the session. Thanks, Liz. And on your way out, there's uh, a few exit questions in a survey that we'll hope you'll take a minute to respond to. And again, in the uh, follow-up email that will go out in the next day or so, we'll uh, send you the PDF and uh, you'll have access to the to recording. Please visit the Transparency Catalog. Use the links in the free listings to invite manufacturers that you know to come take a look at the catalog, to add their products. It's going to make it easier for you to find them. And um, hope you learned something today. And please come back, and we hope you have a good day.